Oh, this is all new. It says going live, and it's got this little fancy countdown now. This is what happens when you don't have a hangout every week. You don't notice these things. They update well, the hey, everybody. Up. Welcome. Yeah, well, let me, let me let me intro. Welcome to Hangouts with James Fee. This is, I think, my first hangout in about a year um, with Steve Coast, uh, who many of you know from moving around every year to a new company. Uh, <laughs> Founder of OpenStreetMap, which just had its 10-year anniversary this month, right? It has. And I, I think I've probably had less jobs than you in the last 10 years, James. Well. Although they have been in different countries and different states, whereas yours have probably been relatively geographically constrained. Yes, I have stayed here in Arizona. Um, you, on the other hand, are a world traveler. But you're still in Colorado yeah. now, are you? I am in beautiful Colorado, the best state in the nation. United States, most rectangular state. Yes, and touches my state by only one little ping prick, right? I mean, just the four corners. Pink is right. <laughs> <laughs> have you been to the four corners? I have not. There's sand dunes down there, right? Actually, I've never been there either, so I don't know. <laughs> it's the flyover corner. So here's, here's a question i got to ask you. So 10 years ago, uh, you're sitting in a pub, I assume. <laughs> I, I don't think the idea of creating such a tools open street map is something one creates uh, while they're sleeping. Um, how the heck did you decide to do this? I think the short answer is naivety. I, but the, the long answer is I had... I was very much in, into Linux at the time, and I had a, a laptop um, that I sort of stole from <laughs> where I was working, and it had two bays in it that allowed you to put batteries in there. Remember when laptops had removable batteries? Yeah. So it had a very long battery life because it had these two battery bays, and I had Linux on it, and then I bought a USB GPS device, which was magnetic, but I, I didn't know how to drive at the time, and I didn't have a car. So I put this thing to, it was basically just a very um, very expensive and clunky way of recording GPS traces. So I wrote a bunch of scripts on this device to turn the screen off, to start recording, to restart the GPS daemon when it crashed, and then put this in a laptop and put the GPS device on the top, and I collected all these traces just for fun. And then I wanted to show them on top of a map, but there weren't any maps, right? You could... Yep. You could download pictures of maps on Linux using Microsoft MapPoint, but you couldn't um, get vector data. So I just thought, why don't I collect vector data and make it myself? So I wrote some pretty naive tools in Java, which I then turned into an applet. But then that meant you needed a backend, so I wrote a big backend in Java as well, which was horrible, <laughs> and used XML on PC, amongst other horrible things. And that's, I mean, that's the beginning of it. That's how it started, was just personal need because there was no vector data available that was of any quality in London. Interesting. So there was no, like, stick it to the queen kind of thing? Like, if she's going to charge me for data, I'm going to do this myself? I'm not sure it's her personal decision, but the, the British government have made decisions over time about trying to privatize um, assets that it owned, which is typically a good thing, but with Ordnance Survey it only went halfway, so it became this public-private partnership. Um, so that was, it was frustrating because at least at the time you couldn't, um, you know, you were paying via your taxation at least two or three times for Ordnance Survey data, because um, my memory is that they were directly funded by the taxpayer, plus your local your local county and so on would be paying them for maps as well. And then if you bought a map, like you go and buy a paper map, then you're paying again, right? Um, it's all adding up to the same costs, but it just meant that you paying and paying and you didn't get what you actually wanted, which was this data, right? Interesting. What so, I wanted anyway. So, okay, so you create this thing, right? Cool, I've got a server, I've got <clears throat> some GPS data I've created, and they're kind of linking back together. But you're just one man. How do you? How did this take off? I mean, how did you decide to get this other people to help? Was it a Linux thing early on that became a mapping thing, or did you go the mapping way first? Early on, mostly Linux. So I went to Linux user groups. So these were groups where people would get together and talk about Linux, basically, over beers, typically on like a Wednesday evening or a Saturday afternoon or something. And they were receptive to the idea because they were 
who knew about open source, and open source and open data are pretty close. Um, and also, it was cute, and it was off to the side. You know, it wasn't. You know, because most of the talks at Linux user groups are very boring. They're like, you know, how I hacked memory management in forty-eight thousand lines of C plus plus or something, right? <laughs> and it's not. It's not applicable to your daily life, right? I mean, it's fun and it's interesting in its own way, but it's not um, orthogonal, right? It's not like, look, here's a new way to think about open source. Um, we could go create these other things, right? Um, so there was a, it was sort of a natural audience, and I used to give these talks all over the place, all over Europe, on on OpenStreetMap, and that's how the initial in, initial ball got rolling, at least from my perspective. I mean, there were other ways too. So we had, you know, I created mailing lists. I created the IRC channel. Uh, argued with people a lot, and then mapping parties, of course. So did mapping parties start before? Um, you, you tried to commercialize this, or was this, I mean? Yeah, mapping parties were very early. I think the first was 2006, so like two years into the projects, and that was the Isle of Wight. Um, and the idea behind those was just to get people together to, to go mapping. So you have a venue, you come and you show people how to use a GPS device, as it was back then, because we didn't have phones with GPSs in them. Um, everyone would go mapping. And they'd come back, and then you'd show them how, how to get that data onto a map, um, and then go to the pub again, basically. Yeah. So why, uh, why Isle of Wight, or Isle of Man? Why Isle of Wight? So the Isle of Wight is an island just south of um, mainland Britain. And the, the short answer is because it's an island, so you'd know when you were done. Because if we had a mapping party anywhere else, you could always claim, well, we should have gone a little bit further, or we should have mapped this or that. Whereas if it's an island, you have a very definite boundary, right? Because if yeah. your feet are wet, it means you're not on the island anymore. So um, that was the 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 that was the 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 first driving reason. The second was that it was tractable; that we could map the whole thing in a weekend with some relatively small number of people. I think it was forty people. Fourteen people mapped an island. Right. That's busy. So, so you've got. I mean, what year was this? Like two thousand six, five. Mm -hmm. So you've got retro old Garmin GPS units here, and you're going I I getting traces. I still have some of them, but yes. And you're going out, and you're getting traces, and you're marking them down, and you're taking them back to Jossum, the Java editor. Was that great at that point, or was this still? Yeah, jo I mean, Jossum existed. It was more basic than it is today, but it was still pretty powerful. And so then you guys just went out and literally created an island. Yeah, and there were other frustrations, um, like the old, old Gecko GPS units, you know, the, the ones before the E-Trex, or the cheap, yeah. they're cheaper than the E-Trex anyway. They had a proprietary serial port, and there was no way to get data off of them. They, you know, they, they could only record, I think it was like three hours at one, one hertz, right, one point a second. Mm -hmm. Like two hours, three hours, something like that, which meant you had to keep stopping and plugging the thing in, and then it used triple A's and they died. So, <laughs> yeah, it was it was a more constrained environment. It reminds me, there's a there's a story. I think it was like when Richard Feynman was trying to figure out where to do his graduate studies. I can't remember which way around it was, but it's like it's something like he went to Caltech and and looked there, and he went to MIT and looked there, and one of them everything was sort of clean and everyone was wearing white coats. And the other one, everything was a mess, and they're like people are ripping in and out boards out of particle accelerators. And he chose the latter one. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it was kind of like that. It was just you know lots of experimentation with um, different hardware, software, and then different ways of getting people to come together. What was well, some of the early focus that sort of drifted off that you didn't go down that route? You know, thinking this would be the way it would go, and then you decided not to go that route. Oh, there were all kinds of mistakes. So I think one big one is a couple of different philosophical points about how how people would map together. So one way that I thought it was going to work is that there'd be some people collecting lots of traces and then other people vectorizing those and then other people putting the metadata, like what the name of the roads were. Right? Mm -hmm. But it didn't really turn out that way. Typically, people would map doing all, all, all of the steps all at once. So they'd go drive, bike around, walk around, 
collect the GPS traces, collect the metadata, do, turn it all into vectors, and then add the metadata in, or in in sort of chunks, right? Rather than it being layers of people doing different steps of the work. So there was that, and then there was a lot of criticism that, you know, the data model was this or that, and that the um, that there wasn't command and control. So, like you think about the way that um, other mapping systems work, where they let you contribute, you typically have like city managers, county managers, um, state managers, and so on. You have this hierarchy. Yeah. So if you come along and you're new, we don't trust you, and we're not going to let you edit anything without your local manager approving it. And then if you want to do something bigger, you have you have to work your way up some sort of hierarchy that doesn't exist in OpenStreetMap. And the reason for that, the reason it doesn't exist, is our problem is finding people, right? So, sort of creating a hierarchy and then expecting people to fill it in, when you know the first, you know, it's, a, it's an easy criticism to make. It's like the first thing you come to to the project is, well, the first thing you want to come and submit data. Well, we're not going to trust you, right? Yeah. That's not a very welcoming environment. So that's one of the reasons it was it was open like that. So there's a couple of things that of how it turned out differently. Yeah. So. <clears throat> So this is starting to grow, and people are starting to use it. Uh, I can't remember when I started getting involved. I guess I could look back and see when I signed up for my account. But it's going all great, and then, then you have this great idea, let's monetize on top of it. Um, yeah, how that <laughs> I mean, so you create CloudMade. I mean, look, we don't have to go deep into CloudMade, but what was CloudMade's goal when you started it? It was kind of a, so the reason I said it's not idea is Red Hat already existed, right? Yeah. So the idea of monetizing open source was out there. I'm not sure that they were actually making any money at the time, but they do now. So why don't we copy Red Hat was essentially the idea that um, you can provide services and um, products on, on top of the open base, right? Yep. Which remains true today. You can do that all over the place because... You know, I was living in, in an environment where, you know, you should do everything yourself and everything should be free and, you know, we should all be friends and so on. But then there was a world where people were paying their mortgages and they needed to just accomplish things. Yeah. Um, so, you know, there's a nice analogy about drills, right? People don't buy drills, they buy holes. A drill is just a convenient way to, to get a hole. Mm -hmm. um, but I was very interested in drills, right? And wanted to graduate up the stacks to, to explore how you uh, how you sold drills. <laughs> I don't know. I'm stretching the metaphor a little bit. Yeah, um, so. But still today, I mean, there are lots of companies around OpenStreetMap providing goods and services on top of it as a, as, a, as a way to monetize, right? Because there's a class of people out there that don't necessarily want to compile everything themselves or set up their own tile servers, and they're much, you know, it's easier for them to write a check than to spend the time. Well, there's a lot of companies that essentially do what CloudMade did, at least initially. With the, you know, there's the uh, the map boxes. I mean, there's there's the, you know, uh, MapQuest. Uh, they they get involved. With it. Yeah, are they still around? MapQuest is still around. Okay. Yeah, I, was, <laughs> I have to check every once in a while. I go to the URL just to see if it exists. Um, so there, I mean, that's. Can you make money doing that though? I mean. Can you grow doing that? I mean, these are small, generally small companies that make products on OpenStreetMap. They're not large Red Hat-like companies. Um, sure. Well, the, 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 the problem, to, you know, one of the issues is, is a race to the bottom, right? I think there's sort of two, two main issues. One is the data quality isn't quite there to compete with commercial offerings, right? Mm -hmm. So in the United States... OpenStreetMap is a great display map. You can look at it. It looks fantastic, but you, you need address data, and you need routing information, and both of those are hard to get. And both of those, OpenStreetMap is very reticent to go about collecting in any meaningful way. Um, so without those two things, it's hard to compete, and it's hard to make, quote, real money. But then the, the, the thing that any business that's dealing with open source has to, has to do is go and differentiate, because someone else can always just take your stuff and then charge a little bit less, right? Assuming that it's that everything you're doing is open source. And then someone else can do it a little bit less and a little bit less and so on. Which is why um, you know highly funded 
VC is, you know, a questionable route on whether you're going to achieve this because when you take VC like we did at, at CloudMed, you limit your time frame, right? Because you only have so much time to burn so much money before someone else owns your company. So yet yeah, that limits the amount of time, so it limits the, the amount of different things you can go try to try and make money. And primarily primarily what you have to do is you have to build relationships and so on. You know, if you're United Airlines, it, that it's open source doesn't really matter for, for Red Hat. Right, it's that they're there and dependable, and they can go fix the computers, and they have offices everywhere. Those kinds of things, those, those are hard to replicate. Having offices and people that smile and wear a suit, that and you know having sufficient large numbers of people, and then having, you know, products on top that go beyond the data. Um, and the issue there with OpenStreetMap is that everyone's rushing to also commoditize all of the tooling, right? So yeah. there's open source routing engines, there's open source display engines. So it's becoming very hard to find something that is, you know, create some moat, as they say at Microsoft, you know, moat around your castle so that people can't just invade. It's tough. It's not impossible, but you just have to think long and hard about how to do it. So jumping off of that, <coughs> Telnav, I mean, you're working there now. I mean, your goal there was what? To create an addressing routing uh, on top of OpenStreetMap, right? I mean, is that essentially why you joined? I think we succeeded in doing that. Right, so you've got Scout. I mean, we can talk about Scout later, but um, are, are, is it, would you say that's the first real routing built on top of OpenStreetMap that's consumer-ready versus hackable, yes. I guess? Okay. Yes, because so, so it's why? easy to build a routing engine, right? It's, yeah. it's really easy to build a naive routing engine. It's harder to build a good, fast routing engine. And then it's harder still to get all the data to go in there so that you build something that's realistic, right? Because you need all the turn restrictions and the speed limits and the one-way streets, and, and a lot of these things don't exist in OpenStreetMap today. Um, but what we did at Telenav is process an awful lot of GPS data. So when, when people drive around using navigation, typically all that, that data is submitted back in order to help improve the navigation experience. So if you can, if you take a sufficiently large amount of GPS, you can figure out, you know, what the speed limits are, or at least what the free flow speed is, which will be, you know, correlate with the, the speed limit. You can figure out where the one-way streets are, the turn restrictions, and so on and so on. And that is sort of super valuable if you want to improve the map to the point where it's routable. And and I guess at this point, Scout is. I mean, I've used it, so it, it where I I mean, it works where I've used it. I mean. I mean, ten years to we to this point. Is, I mean, is that expected, or is that just the reality of creating maps with addresses around the world is just damn hard? Addresses are really difficult, right? So uh, the GPS stuff is super helpful, but then you have to license address data today, um, and it'll be a while before OSM is there, unfortunately. Um, it won't take too long in the United States because there's all this government data. But the rest of the world, where it's actually important, is <laughs> is really difficult. Yeah. Um, so Scout works great in the United States, Europe, Canada. Um, outside of that, where does it work? So there are multiple efforts here, but the the Scout in the United States is primarily what I'm talking about here. Okay. Elsewhere, you know, that's um. Where did right you go? They were right here. I'll check you out. Is that from is that from the anniversary party? Yeah, it's from the anniversary party. So I've got my little scout. Go to www.scout.me. So you had so you had an OpenStreetMap 10th anniversary party in in Phoenix, and the great guys at Telenav sent you a, a pack to to help you celebrate. Yeah, some uh, some stuff, which was nice. Uh, it was a bunch of those parties. I saw a bunch of people at parties around uh, the United States. Yeah, I think there were ten total. I might be wrong. Yeah, we. Uh, I was in California, unfortunately. I missed it. But uh, yeah, uh, they had a good, they good turnout. Actually, you know who was interesting that came was uh, business intelligence uh, people. They're getting really interested in, in mapping. Um, you know, people that, that don't, that, you know, they look and say, hey, I need information. How do I find it? And they see, sort of like you did, that it's hard to get map data. Yes. Um, same problem. But unlike what you had, they could just say, oh, open street map. Here's all this great stuff ready to roll. Um, yeah. It's, it's, I guess it is a different world in that way. Um, someone wants to ask, me to ask, uh, 
what the hell were you thinking with Creative Commons licensing? <laughs> um, so there's a couple of ways of answering that question. The first is that it's hard to create an open source project and make it popular. Um, so if this particular question, per person is, could do a better job, then I'd like to see them do it would be the first answer. The second answer is that um, Creative Commons was all that was available at the time in terms of viral open source licenses. Mm -hmm. um, and that's why we spent so much time creating the open database license, um, which is something that I and a couple of other people kicked off some number of years ago to clarify the problems with CC. Yeah, so, so but I guess he followed up, up with uh, why not just public domain? Um, yeah, sure. Why, why does it have to be some sort of Creative Commons type license? Because of philosophy is the short answer. So there's, there's no data to suggest that public domain is any better than Creative Commons, is better than open database license. We don't have any data. And we don't have any data because we can't go back in time and rerun the experiment to see what OpenStreetMap would look like with public domain, right? Yeah. So given that we don't really have any data to show which is better, picking any of them is, is as good as any other. My philosophy, coming back to the first answer, is that um, we're better off with forcing everybody to contribute back because otherwise they won't. Um, the counter-argument is the BSD software stack and how that went into Windows. So the, my, my memory of this is, which might be a bit hazy, is that the BSD Unix TCP IP stack, which was effectively public domain with a notice, so you just have to say it came from BSD, that was used by Microsoft in some version of Windows. I don't know which version. So in, in one sense, it got enormously distributed, right? This TCP IP stack got, went into every copy of Windows, which effectively at the time would have been every computer in the world. So it was enormously successful. No one will ever know, though. That's the problem, right? So the problem with OSM was if you make it public domain, then what a what a commercial supplier would do is cut out the good bits of OpenStreetMap and use them in their maps. And then they have zero incentive to give back because then they're helping their competitors. So they might focus on the easy things like mapping a city because that takes you know two days and you drive around the grid of the core few miles of a city. And then everything else, which is hard, you just pull it from OpenStreetMap, but you don't contribute the city thing back. Now, some people would say, well, the com those companies, they would give back. And that's a nice story, but the, 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 the challenge is to go prove it, right? And unfortunately, we don't have data either way. Because I could be wrong. Maybe public domain would have worked out fantastically. But if you look around for highly successful, large-scale open source projects based on the public domain, it, it turns out to be a pretty short list compared to everything else. Um, so again, going back to data, is that causation or is that correlation? And you, you, don't, get to, you don't get to choose, right? Because the... There's asymmetric outcomes here. Let's say we have a choice today where we could choose to, let's pretend that we could, right? We, we could move OpenStreetMap to public domain tomorrow. It's a one-way street, right? So yep. maybe it will succeed tomorrow, or maybe it will completely die. You don't know, right? Mm -hmm. And we can, just have, we can have philosophical arguments about maybe it would, maybe it wouldn't, we don't know. Whereas if we keep it with the license it has, it's, it appears it'll keep going. All of our metrics are good. All of the metrics go up and to the right. You know, we get more people. We get more data. Um, there's very, very little, you know, actual data to complain about, right? Yeah. It certainly will hurt some business models because we're um, because it's a viral license and it forces you to give back because you can't just take it and go do whatever you want with it. Which I'm sure there's many people that would love to go do that. Um, but again, I mean, it's we've learned a lot in the last ten years. You could take all of OpenStreetMap source code, or you could take um, all of the tool chains around it, and you could go and create your own map that's public domain. And indeed, people have tried, and they failed. Um, and they probably failed for other reasons. But anyway, that's a kind of long answer to the question. <laughs> uh, I just got a message from uh, uh, MapQuest. They want to let everybody know they're still strong after eighteen years. So. Yeah, good for them. And MapQuest was an early supporter of OpenStreetMap. They sponsored the conference in Denver some, whenever that was, some number of years ago. Yeah. 
Yeah, they were how most of us use maps online to begin with was MapQuest. Yeah. That's um, just how it is. Um, another question for you from a, a viewer. Uh, what What's the one thing you wish you did when you started the project that would help you now? Not give up as much control, I think. Um, that would help an awful lot. Because there's a huge number of great people involved in the project, but it's very hard in any in any pro, in any uh, large organization, whether it's you know you're part of a government or a large company or some other bureaucracy. It's hard to affect change unless you're at the top, right? Yep. So there's lots of good ideas of things we could do in OpenStreetMap, but it would be very very hard to execute without some authoritarian control of like yes, we're just going to go do that. Right, because otherwise it just becomes endless argument, like the public domain versus Creative Commons versus ODBL debate, like um, debate. It's just very circular, and nothing happens. So we've had a lot of progress in in OpenStreetMap, and um, it happens in fits and starts when when people are able to contribute, right? Um, and the question is, would you be able to push things further? with more direct control. Now there's obviously a bunch of downsides because your benevolent dictator or whatever might go crazy, um, which is an obvious downside. But um, the question I is, could you get more as a Churchill than a uh, Oliver Cromwell? <laughs> well, you just have to look at all the various countries recently which have lost their dictators, right, or their effective dictators, um, and look how well they're panning out. Syria, Iraq, Egypt, yeah, Tunisia. Not they're not necessarily you know holiday destinations and some of them used to be not not so long ago so I don't know so we don't overthrow Steve Coast because we don't want to think what open street I don't have that much direct control anymore there's nothing to overthrow <laughs> they might burn it down <laughs> so after CloudMade you go work for Microsoft yeah, you might have heard of them. There's large software. Yeah, I've, I've heard of them, but I never heard of anything you actually did there. Really? You know, I mean, well, here's an opportunity to let me know what you did there. Would you like to hear one of the more interesting things that I worked on? One of the more. I don't want to hear about something more. I want to hear something exciting. I say, wow, I had no idea. I don't think you'll say that about this, but I, I personally quite like it. So at the time when I was working there, um, there was some, um, I'm not sure if I get the chronology right, but there's advertising that, that was happened afterwards about um, attempting to show that search engine quality was not necessarily based on the results you get, but on the logo that was attached, right? So there was this campaign called Bing It On, where they'd show you Google results and Bing results, but they'd swap around the logos, so you couldn't you couldn't tell whether, whether it was coming from Bing or whether it was coming from Google. And then you say which one was better. Right, and people would often be surprised. Based, and I, you know, there was internal testing, I'm sure, and then on, you know, anyone could try this. That actually, wow, there wasn't an awful lot in it in terms of the results, at least for main main queries. Right, long tail queries are harder, of course, but for most of the time, it was fine. So I decided to go do try to do the same thing with maps. So I showed people on Mechanical Turk. I showed them two different maps. Right. And these maps were connected, so if you panned one, the other one would pan. If you zoomed in, the other one would zoom, and so on. And I had a, a grid. If, if you think of a, a grid, this is not what I showed them. This is just conceptually. Yeah. Of different map data sources down one axis. So data sources would be TomTom, here, OpenStreetMap, Google. Those would be your four most available global map data sets available in the world, right? Mm -hmm. And then in your other ax axis, you have style. So uh, Bing used lavender style, it's sort of purpley. Google used uh, yellowy style. Uh, OpenStreetMap used <laughs> a smorgasbord of colors. Uh, MapQuest has a long style and so on, right? Yep. And so you can, interestingly, you could fill this out a little bit. So MapQuest shipped NavTech data with the MapQuest star. Right, but they also shipped OpenStreetMaps data with the MapQuest star, so I could show you those two two maps, and they look very very similar because they're using the same style. There were some minor differences at low zoom levels that they were showing 
terrain, I think it was. But apart from that, they looked very, very similar, but they had completely different data sets behind them, right? One of them was commercial, and one of them was OpenStreetMap. And similarly, you could do the other axis, right? You could uh, keep the data set the same, but you could change the style. So I could show you, uh, you know, Google has an editor to change the style. So I could show you the default Google Map in their colors, or I could show you the Google Map, uh, but trying to make it look like MapQuest, right, or whatever yeah. it is, right? So by showing people these two maps and then asking them which is better, because I'd ask them to look around the map and then ask which is better, you could differentiate whether people cared about the data or whether they cared about the style or neither if you showed a sufficiently large number of people these two, two things. And I learned something very interesting, which was um, nobody really cares about the data, not at all. There was no statistical significance. We even did the chi-squared regressions on this. Um, People didn't mind if the data came from anybody. They really cared about the style. And they don't really care about any of the styles unless it looks yellow. Right? So, so the, the only way to style wins out generally from people's feeling. Yeah. yeah. So you so could show open in yellow, navtech in yellow, tom tom in yellow. But as long as it was yellow, it was a good map. Anything else, people tended to, to rate much more poorly. It was a very stark difference. And so then the question is, why do they like yellow? Is it that yellow is just a nice color? Is it that Google has historically used yellow and people just think that good maps are yellow? Yeah, you're used to um, it. Do people think that, that yellow means that it must come from Google? But you can go ask all those questions, but the, the interesting data point is that the, the, the data set didn't matter, right? Interesting. And the reason that's important is that some of these data sets are extremely expensive and some of them aren't, right? And this was just for a display map use case. So we're just showing it to you to look at. There was no routing. There was no search, right? Those are different problems. Um, but that was kind of fun and interesting. So did you take this back to Microsoft and say, hey, lavender map, no bueno? No comment. <laughs> Fair enough. What is, what is Bing Maps now? Is it still lavender? I don't know. Good question. I haven't Probably looked. is, if I had to guess. Yeah, let's, let me go look at bing.maps, maps.bing. Do, you get, do people at Microsoft really just say, hey, hold on a moment, let me bing it for you? I say that to people all the time because I actually quite like Bing, completely independently of having worked at Microsoft. So I, oh, I it's think still that, lavender. Um, still what's lavender. That? Lavender, yeah. I, don't know, I, I like the Microsoft look, but I guess, you know, I think it's one of those things where I'm just tired of the yellow, <laughs> as opposed to using something else. I don't know. Um, right. The one thing I remember, and I don't know what the outcome of this project was, is you had that, I don't remember what you called it, but it showed you a little map, and it showed you an address and a point, and you dragged the point on top of the house. Yeah. What was that project called? I can't remember. <laughs> so then my the, next the question, what, what did you do with that information is, I don't know. <laughs> well, the important thing is that the effectively the parcel centroid data that we were looking at, so the, the, the center point of every parcel in the United States, um, there was some ability to go do whatever we wanted with that. But the, the problem with the parcel centroid is sort of twofold. I think first the, the centroid itself wasn't okay, but if you moved it, then it suddenly became your property. Um, intellectual property, that is. And then, of course, the centroid isn't the same place as where the actual house is, right? Because an address has a has a whole bunch of complexity behind it. So there's an address, but then there's where your mail gets dropped off. Then there's where the end of the driveway is, which can be completely different places. Yeah. Then there's um, where your actual house is, right? At least. There's, so there's at least, like, three different points associated with an address. And so the question is, could we, could we crowdsource those locations from, um, from aerial imagery and from a starting point of just saying, look, here's a parcel of land with a point. Please drag the point to the house. Um, and it was fairly successful. The problem is you need lots of people to do this over whatever it is, 100 million parcels in the United States. So sort of non-trivial amounts of time. Yeah, I mean, I guess and it's something that you need people to do. I mean, I mean how does Google do it? I mean, they do it programmatically. Rooftop geocoding. They don't Good drive question. a car on the roof. Good question. I don't know. 
Yeah, I mean, I don't know anybody. Go, they would tell us anyway. Um, well, so here's this is actually a very interesting thought that I've had, and this is hypothetical. Like I don't know if this will ever. I know, right? Um, so Amazon is apparently, hopefully, in their mind, going to be having drones dropping packages off on the front of your house. Um, right. How the hell are they going to do that? Well, let's say they, let's say they figure it out. Let's say they they figure out that they can drive to you know they can fly out to your address. They can identify the house and they can identify the front door. It drops a package off at the front door. GPS that point. All of a sudden, Amazon has all the front doors in the whole world. Right? Yeah. There are cheaper ways of getting that, but sure. But if they're delivering, I mean, they're, but they can do that just as they deliver packages. Yeah, I mean, there are some, sub, sub, there are some substantial problems you've sort of glossed over, one of which is the accuracy of GPS. But effectively, yes. I mean, if let's we'll say you're 10 feet of the front door, close enough, right? Yeah, well, you're going to have to be. But the problem is 10 feet, you might fly into a tree, right? So you need some sort of um, positioning system. You know, once you're up in the air, GPS is fine, right? You're flying along and there's no obstacles. No, 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 no. Okay, so, yeah, so I didn't mean to gloss over. I just assumed that was all figured out, that some engineer is going to Okay, let's assume all the hot problems are figured out. But let's just assume that it can get drop a package off at your front door without crashing into a tree. At that point, sure. they can take a GPS of that front door. Well, they'll probably already have it because they need to know the location where they're going, right? Not necessarily, right? So let's say they go to the house and the address takes them to the, you know, the rooftop. Oh, of the you're house. saying they already know where the house is. They need to know where the front door is. Right to drop it off. So they're going to have some sort of optical recognition to figure out what a door is. So you better hope your window doesn't look like a door. If you get home, there's going to be a package yeah. on your second floor balcony because it couldn't tell. It's a good question. So positional accuracy down to the front door is going to be kind of hard and interesting to do because um, the size of these devices, and then you want to avoid things like recirculation. So that the fans on it, you don't want to get too close to anything. Um, essentially, so, but yes, yes, they could do that. Yeah, I mean, they have a, they have they have their own map. What, so, what do you know about Amazon Maps? I don't know nothing about. I don't have any Amazon device. Have you looked at the Fire Maps or whatever they call it now? I've not. I don't think I can. You can't. They're not available. You can't buy them yet, right? Well, you can buy them, but when do they ship? I don't think they're shipped yet. I well, they have the, the tablet, right? Isn't it on the tablet? Or no, it's only on the phone. I believe it's on the phone. I don't know. I guess. Well, they. I'm curious. I guess I'm curious to see how they got their maps. Whether that's. I mean, it's probably not OpenStreetMap data. No, I think they use here, but I might be wrong. Here, there. Is it here still here? <laughs> it's kind of an awkward word to say sometimes, isn't it? Go and use here. Like, what? <laughs> I was. We were at the Esri conference a couple of weeks ago, and I. Some guy texted me. And I said, hey, let's meet up. And I said, where are you? And he, he goes, I'm right next to here. And I'm like, looked at it for a minute. And I'm like, oh, wait, he's next to the here booth at the expo. I'm right here. Right. Yeah. I, I always said, you know this, I've said for years, the problem with NavTech is the name. They had to change it. And so. That's right. <laughs> uh, no, I liked OV maps. I had no idea what an OV was. But someone once told me it means like, Thank you, or hello, or yo, or map. Or in Swedish. Oh, Finnish, sorry. Finnish. 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 So, so you're at Telnav right now. I am. And you've shipped a product, not you personally, but your team. Uh-huh. What are you doing now? <laughs> can you just hold that up for another 10 minutes? Yeah, so I'll hold this up so while everybody can actually, there you go. It's actually very effective, isn't it? Black on yellow. It is. It's, it's as sexy as a bag could get. <laughs> it even works upside down. The S still is an S. Oh, look at that. Now it says what? Look it says it. gunt. It's like Rotational a Rotational symmetry. <laughs> You're such a skunt. Skunf. s -conf. Hey, Careful. there you go. That's the s -conf. <laughs> <laughs> so what are, what are you doing now at Telnav? Trying to figure out addressing from different perspectives because that's going to be the, the limiting factor for OpenStreetMap. 
Um, we need to get all the addresses we can, whether that's in OpenStreetMap or, or some, some other way. And the question is, how do you get them? Because without addresses, you can't, you know, from a consumer's point of view, you want to type in an address and you want to be routed there. So if you can't type in an address, then, then that's your first problem, right? Um, and addresses are very available in the United States. So the United States is not the problem, right? Because Tiger address ranges are available, which are, you know, almost kind of good enough. The 3,000 counties in the United States, they have, well, most of them have typically good data that is available for a price. And that price is typically not very high, right, for this data. Um, it's the rest of the world that's a problem, and particularly the monetizable part of the rest of the world, which is, you know, Canada and Western Europe, maybe. Um, although I really should hesitate at Canada and Australia. They're great places. There's just not a huge economy compared to the West, you know, Western Europe. Um, and that's a big, hard problem. And it's, it's made even harder because there's few ways to infer the address data. Yeah. So in the United States, typically everything goes along in a chain. You know, house number one is next to house number two. And these are predictable over entire cities, right? You see all the house numbers as a wave across them. The rest of the world isn't, unfortunately, that simple. Okay. So if you have any ideas about how to get every address um, in a reasonable amount of time in Western Europe for a reasonable cost, <laughs> of all ears. Well, I was just going to ask you, so I said, is this a problem you've figured out, or is this a problem you just acknowledge as a problem? Well, you can look around at what other people have done, and it, it, it essentially comes down to throwing huge amounts of money at the problem. Right. right, drive a truck so, down every street in Western yeah. Europe. Yeah, so if, you, if you happen to have a network of cars that drive every road in, on a continent, then that's incredibly useful, right? Because it's very, if the imagery is high resolution enough, then you get all the, the addresses. And then you can employ some crowdsourcing um, you know, uh, systems to get people to type in those numbers for you. And, well, and the capture, right? I, mean, I see that all the time now is the captures the right. house numbers for Google. Right. <laughs> Brilliant. Yeah, no, it's very, it's very clever. But you need this big, large lump cost called the, you know, people driving those street view cameras, right? They're the interns. Didn't you see the movie Interns? <laughs> I did not. But I saw the Onion review of it. Well, oh, I'm sure it was just as good that, as the movie. That was funny. The Onion review said something like, Interns, it, it was... Who, who are the actors again? Remind me. It's, uh, um... Oh, son of a bitch. Hold on. Is it Vince Vaughn? Yeah, Vince Vaughn and uh, uh, the guy who has a brother that sort of looks like him. Yeah. Uh, so the, the Onion Review is I just great. saw it the other day, and I can't think of his name. I have no idea. Owen Wilson. Oh. Yeah, there you go. It was some, So the, the Onion Review was something like uh, Vince Vaughn and, and, and Owen Wilson's great 1995 movie, <laughs> The Intention. <laughs> right. Uh, but that's all you, you just, I mean, and they just said the, what is it, I was driving into work today, the average unemployment rate in Western Europe is 12%. Right. And what's the average, you know, minimum wage that's stopping people from being employed? That would be the problem. Uh, I, that I don't know. I guess that's, a, that's I guess you just, you're just full of problems. You're not full of so solutions. Well, <laughs> at least I know what the problems are. <laughs> fair, fair enough. Fair enough. Um, so the, the the problem is that unemployment doesn't necessarily push down employment price when there's a government barrier to the floor, right? No, true. That's true. Yeah, in Europe, there most of Europe there is one. I guess all of Europe, at least. Western Pretty Europe. much, which which keeps unemployment high. So, you know, yes, if there really was that, and you're able to go and pay, you know, smaller, lower dollar values for for labor, then then you'd be able to do it somewhat cheaply. I mean, ignoring the cost of the vehicles and the cars and so on. Yeah. I mean, I always read about the French farmers driving their tractors into Paris. I mean, why don't you put some GPS units on those tractors? That'll show. <laughs> yes. <All right>. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. I mean, the French will just take pictures of everywhere. Yes. Um, the, France is a great, is a great example of um, technological innovation, right? Like forcing Amazon to, to not do free delivery, so they have to charge a penny for free delivery. Yeah, and and the whole iPhones, they have to have those stupid uh, converters to go to the US micro USB. You seen that? 
that the Apple has a proprietary connector and somehow that's anti-competitive. Right. We just had all our Blackberries. I don't know. Well, you have. What well, you have? Well, show everybody your your fancy tablet. You want to see my fancy tablet? Yeah. Look at this thing. You got to say, there we go. Yeah. So it's a Microsoft device. Yeah. Um, you are one of like the eight people that have bought one of those. Actually, they sell relatively well, believe it or not. And like most people, they keep the numbers secret. So you know the number of. Um, Kindle Fire tablets, as an example, we still don't know, don't know how many were actually sold, but it's great. You know, the Surface One was, you know, interesting but painful. The Surface Two was slightly less painful, and this is a great device. I use it as my tablet, use it as my laptop. It's good. It's better than an iPad, and it's better than a laptop. So, does it have a GPS in it? It's a good question. I don't think it does, and it doesn't have mobile data either. No, that's probably why they would put that on the same chip. So yeah. you can't map while you're going around. Your tablet. No, I cannot. But, can't you know, be the guy probably. with your tablet holding it up, taking pictures, right? You know. Like, but then I can't with the the MacBook Pro that I'm talking to you on, right? Either. That's f fair enough. Fair enough. Um, good, good point, Steve. <laughs> yes. Counterpoint. Yeah. The Queen would be happy. Yeah. So, um, so you're just you're you're worried about Europe, hoping to solve that problem. Um, what about just with the project itself? I mean, what is, uh, you know, you're never done with a project like this. Um, what's the next 10 years of OpenStreetMap going to be? Is it going to be addressing? Well, it's the same two things. It's, you need addressing data. I mean, look, assuming, assuming that, you know, it's not just a collective, right, and it, it, we want to move, we want, we want the data to be good enough to be used by everybody, then you need those two things. You need addressing data, and you need navigate navigable information, right? Mm -hmm. And it's it's hard today, not for technical reasons, mostly cultural reasons and um, user interface and you know philosophy to get those things into the project, right? Um, but that's what it's about. And then you know for some value of done, you could claim it's done. Of course, the map changes all the time, and you need to have little changes here and there. But getting all the address data in is is pretty much the the number one thing that needs to happen somehow. Yeah, how do you, so is there any method of making sure that the quality of address data is recognized in the system? I can't remember. I mean, I put addresses in, but... Um. So there, there are various sort of out-of-band ways of testing addresses. So um, if you are, I don't know, who's a large retailer, Walmart, or you're a credit card company or something, right, then you're going to have a list of all of your customers' addresses, right? So you can test all of those addresses against against the um, the list that you have in OpenStreetMap or something, right? The locations may or may not be correct, but at least it tells you: Do you have the addresses or not? Is it in the right city? Is it near the correct road that is mentioned in the address? You know, so there are large numbers of tests you can do to, to figure out the the quality is any good. There's nothing though you can do internally to the project though. You, you only do that when you like. Telnav can do that because they have other information. Well, anyone could do it, but it's 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 similar to how do you prove the quality of the map itself? It's the same thing. It's a bunch of data, right? Yeah, I get. I guess so. Um, what about the back end? I mean, is it? It's kind of retro. I I don't know what you're talking about, James. What what is retro about it? It's well. I mean, it just it's it's not. I mean, the, I, I guess I, you don't store data spatially, right? Everything is stored flat file in a way, blobbish. Um, not really. So I mean, in in the database itself, there's a, a a method to speed up the. So when you're doing a bounding box, right, to find out what everything is in the box, right, yeah. there are some some ways to speed that up. It's not just two columns of you know. Latitude and full nodes. Then the there's a huge trade-off with 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 storing stuff, quote unquote, spatially, right? Yeah, absolutely. It, and you you you're basically picking between: do I want my queries to be fast, or do, do I want my updates to be fast, right? Because you have to store multiple copies of all the data, and if if you're storing this as I don't know, you know, spatial objects in a spatial column or something, because 
in OpenStreetMap, you know, in, at least in theory, if you can move one node and that node connects two different roads, then you only have to move the node once, and it effectively updates both of the roads which you know pass through that that same point, that same node. Yeah. If you store things spatially and you have two basically line strings, I guess, for them, then you you have to do two row updates, right? And you also lose the um, the nice topological nature of the thing, right? And so you, you pick your poison, right? And I, I think the choice that we made was was a good one. Um, and I, I think it was good. I think it was good to not follow orthodoxy, because if we'd been orthodox, we would have, you know, the first thing we would have done is build a giant GIS system, and then the second thing we'd done was um, have some big referential integrity system, and then the third thing would be we'd build some sort of ontological system that are, you know, a freeway is type 52 and a road is type 9. So, but we weren't looking at it from those orthodox kind of ways. It was how do you get ordinary people on the street to contribute map data, right? Which is why the tagging system exists and why there's a low barrier to entry and why the data looks like it does. Um, so I don't think it's retro at all. I think probably the XML transport is retro. Well, that's it's still, no. that's XML. Still XML. Again, I heard. That's XML is the new JSON. Really? Is what someone well, told there me. you go. <laughs> Everything's <laughs> fine. Just don't change anything, and in ten years it'll be back to completely hip. I don't know. <laughs> well, cool. Well, we're up here against an hour. Um, it's funny how time flies when you get to talk about OpenStreetMap, huh? Especially me, because I don't get to talk about it at all. No, you don't. That's a shame. You're stuck at home with the family. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much for bringing up OpenStreetMap, so I could spend some time reminiscing. <laughs> Is, is you, you don't run the, the family table at night when you're having dinner? Just talk to the wife about... Uh, nodes and ways. Nodes and ways and XML transfers and yeah. conversion from yeah, Java to, to Ruby. To Ruby on Rails. Yeah. No? No. <laughs> I guess not. And uh, I don't know, should I... I may go down to the Microsoft store here in Scottsdale and buy myself a uh, Surface 3. That great device, I'm telling you. Thanks, you very good. Yeah, does it, but it doesn't run my apps, though. I don't know what your apps are. I don't know either. Where's my phone? Oh, you were talking to me on a PC, so it, took, it, it, it runs all of your apps. Well, no, I, I guess I've got, what, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram... Yeah, you're right. They they don't you you can't use those on a PC. It just doesn't work. <laughs> <laughs> so and also the also the internet doesn't work. And and you'd be surprised you can't type on it. <laughs> I mean, if all of those things work, it has apps for actually all of those things. Does it have a Microsoft key? I'm not sure what that means. That's that little key. Let me see if I can tilt this down here. Let me see if I can see this key. Oh no, it's not going to show. But there's that little key that looks. Oh no! <laughs> oh, that's a fitting end. I just put it to sleep. <laughs> you there? <laughs> 